here with Natasha Hastings. And uh, let me introduce my co-host today, Alian Pompey. Um, a, she was a quarter miler for Guyana and also Olympian. So thanks for joining and, and being a co-host. So Natasha, let me just run down your resume really quickly, okay? Um, okay. From Harlem, shout outs to New York. And I actually have family in Harlem, so that's pretty cool. And actually, I pro we probably ran around the same time but you were just way better than me in high school. So we probably had the same meet, but you didn't notice me. Like definitely ran at the armory a couple of times. So uh, let's see. Don't hurt Personal yourself trying to remember. Well, <laughs> well no, because <laughs> I'm getting ready to say no, because you're older than me, but then we were in school together. I'm so. not that much, yeah, like, come on, I'm like two years older than you. Yeah. So, so like, you. I was, yeah. Yeah, you were good <laughs> in high school, like the whole time yeah no, exactly that's that's what i no thought <laughs> exactly no comment so first thing let's go be a personal best because these are fast and i ran 400 before and i've run 49 before so that's really fast you would have smoked me here on this day 49.84 in the 400 22.57 and you're also fast like quick short sprints 11.2 in the 100 11.24 so you're just across the board sprints Cool stuff. You probably can run an eight. Can you run an eight? You can run an eight, can't you? She bet not. She bet. Just say no. Say for, no. <laughs> for my sanity and Thank self. You. And I say no. <laughs> okay. Was that? No comment? No, no comment. <laughs> okay. Okay. Your coach is going to see this and be like, no. Um, so you have a slew of medals going back from the World Youth, the Pan Am Juniors. World Juniors, World Relays, the Indoor and Outdoor World Championship, and two Olympic goals from the, 20, the 2008 and the 2016 games in the 4x4. Very, mm -hmm. very impressive. And I'm assuming you were preparing for the games this year had it not been set, yeah. set back. And, mm -hmm. and you're going for some more medals next year, I'm assuming, as well. So that's Correct. that's exciting. Correct. Yeah. It's good Scary. stuff. So <laughs> an extensive resume, um, lots of winning and lots of success. Um, you were NCAA champion as well in the four in the four hundred. I think you ran like fifty point one or something along those lines. Some something fast. So long ago. Don't even remember. Yeah, just one won another medal. No. <laughs> so tell me, how did you get started? You started very young. You were winning in like youth stuff, right? So how did you get started with track and field? I'm going to guess very similarly to you and Alian because I'm from New York. I'm just going to make one correction. Oh, I'm man. from Queens, but I, I went to school in Harlem. Oh, man. You know what? So that's even better because I have family <laughs> in Queens, so that's better. So, <laughs> my bad, but that's better. You have family. No, it's fine. I, I have family everywhere. So that, that's the point that I'm getting to. My mom's mm -hmm. trying my dad's Jamaican. Both of them ran track. Athletics in the islands mm, is just the blood. Like, yeah. So um, I, I literally, I honestly feel like I was born into it. Like I don't remember life without running, even when I wasn't like on an organized team training specifically for the sport. I was always around it. Mm -hmm. um, whether it would be my mom putting me in the Colgate women's games every year. Um, my father was a coach, so I would go to track practice with him. So it, it was just in my blood, in the family. Even when I retire, I'll still be running. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and so you ran all through, which age did you, did you start exactly, track and field? I officially joined the team when I was nine. Okay, yeah, I started in second grade. So it was like the first thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. How about you, Alian? When was when was uh? I actually started like, like my junior year in high school when I got here. So when you were I late. Want, you were yeah, late, I, especially I, for I, an I islander. Really I didn't. <laughs> well, Guyana, I, I was. I did it when I was in Guyana, and mm -hmm. my sister was in track. Um, and she dusted me so badly. I was like, <laughs> I'm not doing this again. It's not for you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was embarrassing. It's my younger sister. Um, so I was like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to academics for a while. Um, right. So I did that. And then junior year in high school, I got back into it. And you and you're uh, Guyanese. You still have the national record? 
I do. I'm barely hanging on though. Whatever. Um, so you passed for like 20 years, like 50 point barely something. Hanging barely hanging on. We got a couple girls that can smash that. Oh yeah. Yeah. We okay. Do. Well, maybe it'll happen at your invitational. Even better. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So Tasha was. What's that? You gotta get Tasha to Guyana one day. I know the Alian Pompey Invitational in Guyana. What's up, Natasha? I'm with it. Just get me before I retire. But I'll I'll come wave and kiss some babies and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love so, it. So people are going to think I have a bias because I keep bringing South Carolina folks on here. I can't help it that the team was just really good and have so many amazing athletes like yourself. So tell me, how did you end up at SC and, um, and tell me about your experience there and then working your way up to, uh, you know, be an NCAA champion. I'm curious about this. And then also about the, uh, you know, your, your nickname was it 400 diva is what I'm reading online. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, your intro kind of just said it, and and <laughs> Coach Fry hates to hear this story, but I knew very early that I wanted to go to Carolina, um, mm -hmm. largely because of the quarter miler tradition at South Carolina. That I was looking for a program that um, I could thrive in as a quarter miler, but then also um, I knew that he was training like the likes of um, Terrence, Tramel, um, mm -hmm. Lashinda Demas. Tiffany, yeah. Ross Williams, um, I'm blanking on, um, oh my gosh, I'm looking at their faces and I can't get the names out. Yeah, it's a, it's a bunch. <laughs> Why am I, and this one is going to be embarrassing when I um, get uh -huh. his name out. The hurdler. Siobhan Stutter? There's a couple Not hurdlers. I'm I mean, talking about the guy. There was Kenneth, um, there was Kay Ferg. He was, uh, I'm talking about the pros. I mean, they were, he was, oh, Alan, the, Alan, Alan, Alan. Johnson. yeah. Oh, embarrassing. <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm looking at his face and my head is this out. <laughs> like, yes, please I actually can. Out. I don't know if I will, but I can. And, and, <laughs> I tried, and that's I um, <laughs> Alan Johnson, a living legend, of course. The living legend. One of the Alan greatest Johnson. hurdlers ever. So that's but that's so Coach cool. Fry had a resume collegiately and professionally that I was just like, that's the place that I want to be. But I still very much so played hard to get. Like I never ah. let Coach Fry know, and this this is why he hates to hear this story. Like every step of the recruiting process that he had to go through, he went through, and I never <laughs> let on that like. Yeah, I'm going to UCLA, I'm going to Texas, I'm going to Maryland, but I know I'm going to South Carolina. Like I yeah. I knew all along yeah yeah i just and i'm i'm glad i obviously the choice worked out for me of course, um yeah. so it's definitely a, a decision that i'm i'm happy with and i've rep gamecocks till i die i know some people are like mm, not so much but <laughs> really oh, come on yeah, I, I enjoyed my experience there and i mean i had I, mean, I still there. yeah I mean, I still rep, you know, I still kind of, it's kind of conflict, a conflict of interest because I'm a college you coach, know, head coach. Yeah. And it's crazy that I keep on, you know, I'm bringing all of you on and talking about South Carolina. I'm probably impacting my recruiting. I need to chill, bring some other people around. But, uh, but it was the same thing with me. Um, I felt like I had wanted to go from when I was younger. I had went to a track meet there. It was like some youth games thing when I was a kid and we actually stayed on campus. And so I competed. Oh on campus when I was, you know, I, we flew up from the Virgin Islands and competed up there. And then, uh, so it was just always some connection and you know, I had wanted to go and I had, uh, someone had introduced me to Coach Fry when I was in high school in Jersey, you know, my high school coach, he's like, oh, I know this coach. And so it was like the second and third time I had kind of had this South Carolina thing come around and I still didn't think that I was, you know, gonna go cause I had run decently well but I hadn't run fast enough and I got injured and I wasn't going to go to college. And then, you know, my, my folks were like, no, you're going to college. We're going to take out loans. You're going to do something. And that's how I just ended up walking on in South Carolina. Cause I was like, well, I always wanted to go run there. Adrian, I didn't know that. No, I was a walk on. I walked on my freshman year and I ended up just beating everybody and then getting a full. 
Yeah. I thought you was a fool the whole time. Nah, nah, man. I was, I was, I was pretty decent in Jersey, but I wasn't like Tawana. You know, she was like the queen yeah. of Jersey. I was like good enough to like get recruited, but not good enough for a, a scholarship. And I was like, man, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I just walked on and figure I had one year to prove myself if I was going home. So <laughs> I just went as hard as I could. And, and then it was like I was training with Otis every day. So Otis. you know, you train with a future, you know, silver medalist, you're gonna get a little better. Yeah, yeah. And then and then, and then being around and then and then even afterwards, just being around all of you guys, like it was just a really good team. So you know, you could come into the situation already being good and not and taking it for granted, or you could come into it like, wow, these are really good people. They're going to all make me better. Steel sharp, exactly. steel sharp and steel. You know, it was definitely an opportunity to train up. Oh, yeah. Definitely, I mean, sure. your training group, who was your training group at the time? Yeah, first of all, let me just start off with freshman year. <laughs> <laughs> I went from, you know, coming from high school, being the star of my team to going to South Carolina and like looking at the roster. And I was like, wait, I might not even be on this B4 by four. <laughs> <laughs> like we were just stacked. And, and then to top it off, I came in right after Tiffany had uh, Samaya had her baby. And Tiffany came back for fall training and it was probably like three or four weeks into training. And I was like, it, it was interesting because I came from in New York, my team was was very much, or my coach rather, was of the philosophy of like over distance, cross country, all that stuff, right? Oh, no. So when I got to Carolina and it was very speed based, like I remember the first day of practice was like 60 meter, 80 meters. I was like, huh, we're not doing <laughs> 600s, 800s. And so the training was easy in the sense that I came from a long program to a shorter program, mm -hmm. however, Tiffany Ross Williams, Ross at the time, post baby. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let me say something. I was like, um, you just had a baby. Like, what's up? I can't keep up. <laughs> but the team, my teammates were really like, it was really a track meet every day. And mm -hmm. I think that that was one of the things that definitely lended to our toughness um, as competitors because, you know, we were lining up every day. I was lining up with Tiffany, Stephanie Smith, um, Farron Giles, Amberly Nesbitt, like we were Shalonda Solomon, like it was a, a, a meet every day. <laughs> like, and uh, Tiffany is the one that always stands out to me though, always the one that I remember because I'm like, she just had a baby and I, I cannot keep up. Like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. So I'm curious about the the whole um, journey to becoming an NCAA champion. You know, NCAA, NCAAs is obviously super competitive. You know, you competed in the SEC, which was a, a super competitive conference. And even at South Carolina, practice was very competitive. So I'm sure all of that contributed to you, you know, getting to the point where you would be NCAA champion. But I'm just, you know, for those who who haven't experienced that or who are curious as to what it takes to get to that level, you know, just talk a little bit about that journey or that year that you won. And 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 was it an up and down year? Or were you just dominant the whole year? Or was, you know, were there any obstacles or injuries that you had to kind of get by? Or was it like, yeah. hey, you were locked in and it was guaranteed? I was locked in. Um, nice. And it was an exceptional year. It was I was undefeated that year? Um, undefeated. Yeah. Like how many races did you do? You think you ran that year? <sighs> if you could remember, I, I you know. It was Carolina Day, so it was a lot. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you know it was I was I was running the four by one, four mm -hmm. by four, four and two. Um, I doubled up until national. So I doubled at regionals. I doubled at um, SECs. Um, did I do yeah, I doubled at, at regionals because I set the, the 200 record at Florida too. Yeah. Casually. So it that set the record, was, but yeah. Right. It was a lot of races. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of races, but I will say there were a, a couple of things that I attribute to that year. The sophomore year, um, I had bursitis and I had, I had an injury my freshman year, an injury my sophomore year, but sophomore year, that injury was the one that like really sat me down. 
um, I was out for quite a bit of time, six to eight weeks or Hold something. On. Let's go back. Let's go back. Cause I want to hear about those. I want to you to highlight those injuries because I mean, you're a, you're a medalist, you have multiple medals and, and folks are going to watch this. Some folks who are experiencing these things, injuries, you know, and, or they'll get injured for the first time. And it's like, I don't know how to deal with it. So right. you ended up getting past that. So you were injured your freshman year. Yeah. And, and I, so I pulled my quad in the final of the indoor 400. Oh, wow. And it was literally like, I came out of the blocks, took like three or four steps. Um, and my quad just went. Wow. Um, so I was out for a while with that. That's disappointing. Um, man. And at it was double A's. Yeah. At NCAA. Um, and let me just say, like also talking about, so I graduated high school 5204. I went into that final with a PB of 518. So Ooh, like I was excited. like, yeah, like ready to go, you know? Um, so that happens. We go to outdoor NCs. I play sixth. And then the following year, I don't even remember what, I don't even think I made. Um, no, I didn't make the, the indoor. Um, I didn't even make it to nationals because I got bursitis in the fall. And you know that fall training. Yeah, it's crucial. That fall training, like, you mm. know, you're just kind of trying to get in shape for the rest of the season. And so... I, and then I ended up placing, I remember placing six at Outdoor Nationals that year as well. And then my junior year, I went into it like, okay, <laughs> I've come off of two seasons of being injured and things not necessarily happening the way that I planned for them to happen. And I also came into Carolina with the plans of like, I'm studying exercise science. I want to become a chiropractor one day. So I was like, maybe I'll shift my focus to that. Oh, right wow. like I'm I'm for whatever reason I just can't stay healthy and I, I had a couple of injuries in high school too so there was a combination of so a feeling like my back was against the wall in terms of like I've been so injured it's been so bad it can't get any worse but also feeling like <laughs> there's no pressure now Cause it was like, I was, you know, kind of down there. Um, and then also saying that I'm kind of shifting my, my focus to my studies a little bit more, but then also my junior year was also my introduction to sports psychology and sort of tapping into training my mind as well as wow. training on the track. And it literally, it, I, it got to a point in the season I mentioned, the season was, it was an undefeated season. By the time we got to outdoors, every single race that I ran in the quarter was a PB. So this is the year you, you said you got into, you uh, discovered sports psychology? Yeah, I started seeing Dr. Malone on campus. That's funny you say that because you're not the first person who's told me that, you know, actually seeing a sports psychologist or somebody who can, you know, they can talk to has, has helped them, you know, as far as performances and just, you know, advancing their yeah. career. So that's, I think that gets overlooked at times of how exactly. important that could be, you know, as an athlete, you're dealing with a lot of stress, a lot of things and, and track especially is, is not very forgiving. You know, I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, if you can't go at a hundred percent, you're going to lose Every and you're going to run. And yeah. If you're not like at your complete best, you're going to lose. And if you're 1% off, you're running a half a second slower than your PR and you feel terrible. So track is not forgiving. And, and it can yeah. be, you know, when you're not on, it's, it can, it, you can be down. And track athletes are uh, a group of athletes that suffer from depression. So mm -hmm. uh, at a high, at high rates. So mm -hmm. it's, I'm glad that you mentioned that so people can see that someone who's as successful as you, you know, that was important, sports psychology and talking to somebody. And, and that probably needs to be highlighted some more. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Um, so much so that I'm now studying clinical mental health because that's Perfect. what I want to go into. <laughs> so I don't know that I'm going to go the psychology route because, mm -hmm. you know, 34, I ain't really got time for 10 more <laughs> years of school. But yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think that number one, I just felt like I have benefited 
so much from sports psychology and counseling, but also, you know, when we talk about athletes in particular and, and track and field, yes, but most sports, um, a lot of us come from backgrounds where we've been through some things, you know, yeah, athletic. Yeah, athletics is our ticket to an education or, you know, our ticket out of our situation. And a lot of times we don't even realize that some of that stuff is actually some of what's affecting our performance as well. So, you know, yeah. just destigmatizing psychology or mental health period, whether it be as an athlete, because, you know, we have this sense of superheroism, not asking for help and then coming from a black community don't tell nobody our business yeah. <laughs> mental health is not a, a, a conversation but it really is something that can be beneficial and you know I try to talk about it as much as possible because I saw a shift in my collegiate performance and then again when I revisited it in, in my professional career that really you know whatever I do on the track is all well and good but if my mind isn't functioning at optimal function everything else is kind of on the wayside. Yeah. When in your um, professional career did you revisit that? Uh, 2012. So I love to highlight, mm -hmm. there's that gold in 2008, a gold in 2016. What happened in 2012? <laughs> I did not make the Olympic team. And um, to kind of cut through like, I was, so that would, I was 26, yeah, 26. So, you know, 26 is kind of like that age where it's like, everyone's expecting you to be at your prime. And how could I not make the team at this moment? And as fate would have it, my mom happened to be sitting next to a sports psychologist at the trials. And he offered to work with me and I started working with him um, short. We started working together the off season of 2013. And it was literally, I'll, I'll never forget our first session. He asked me, um, what do you say to yourself when you're standing on the line? And it was literally everything negative, like, um, this is going to hurt. <laughs> I don't want to be here. <laughs> you start last, there with the 400. If you start yeah, with this last one, hurt. it's going to hurt. Yeah. <laughs> <It's gonna> die. <laughs> and verbatim, his words were, my God, Natasha, you have lost the race before the gun even goes off. Yeah. And our sessions were literally me working on how to change my negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And Man. sometimes I hate telling this story because I, I, it sounds very oversimplified because it's literally changing how you speak to yourself. Um, but it was something that took constant practice and months of practice and I'm still practicing it. <laughs> I still have to snap myself out of, hey, you wouldn't say that to a girlfriend. Don't say that to yourself. Um, but it really was taking that time to, to identify how I was speaking to myself and how my body was then digesting that and then manifesting it. Wow, that's, you know, it's funny you bring that point up. I just had this conversation with one of, one of my athletes and, you know, very talented athlete, but constantly saying, just mildly negative things and not thinking that it has an impact. And I'm like, Hey, you know, that stuff does catch up. Like you, you want to change that around a little bit and start speaking positive things. And I learned that since I was a kid, I had a coach who, anytime we said the word can't, he would give us push-ups. Anytime you would say can't, and you realize that word is pointless because most of the time, if you try something enough, you're able to do it. So it's like, why am I even taking the time to be like, I can't do this instead of just practicing it until I actually can do it and do it well. And so that's, that's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, when people hear this, they, they, there are commonalities here. You know, you talk to Lashinda and she says she talked to somebody who reinforced mindfulness and said, Hey, when you go on the line, you have to be mindful. And, you know, she would get on the line and kind of like, you know, just uh, she would do something. I, it's it's hard to describe, but it was around the same thread of the mental the mental aspect and and mental preparation and mental toughness and things like that. And so, I, I just love hearing you go into that because, you know, what's the common depiction of you know like athletes and sports? It's all about the toughness and working hard, but folks forget that there's that other piece you know you can work hard and be tough but if you're not ready to go out there and execute if you don't have that confidence feeling like you're gonna win 
you know, it's going to be, you're going to have a hard time. So I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's cool hearing people. Enemies, what's that? Yeah. It's cool hearing people. Our worst enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's cool hearing people as good as you were, who, you know, kind of talk about the same problems that everyone else has, you know, with, you know, confidence and, 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 and talking down on themselves. So no, that's, that's important. Both of, both of you. Um, do you feel like there's kind of been a shift since you've been in college to now the kids that, that are in college? that it's kind of more common or more acceptable that they seek a psychologist or talk to someone about that? Because it, when I was, I'm a little bit, little bit older than both of you. And that was not even an option. Like we would have had to have been so wealthy for me to even say, I'm going to go see a psychologist about this. I think the access has definitely changed. And I think largely um, because it's more accepted and because it's more accepted in the athletic community, you're starting to see athletic departments offer the services. So quite frankly, I probably never would have walked into Dr. Malone's office if Coach Fry didn't say, I think you should go talk to this psychologist. Um, at, as part of my program, um, two weeks ago, I had to interview a, a counselor and I, I was lucky enough to find a sports counselor who's on campus at Temple. And one of the things that he also pointed out was that um, because athletic departments are seeing the value of it, they're now hiring counselors and psychologists on their own staff. So their athletes don't have to walk into the actual counseling building and mm -hmm. taking that piece away and giving a little bit more of anonym anonymity to the, the athletes, they're willing to seek it more on their own now as well. So. The, the different points of access. And, and he also has a private practice and he said he sees some high school athletes too, which I was surprised by that because I would have never <laughs> in high school, like I said, in college, it didn't even dawn on me until Coach Fry suggested it. But I think also in the world of social media and making things more accessible and kids have access to different people and things then now, you know, people tend to, to latch on to, to different ideas that we probably wouldn't have thought of back in our day. That's yeah. true. Yeah, it's absolutely much less of a stigma. I'm, I'm noticing folks are a lot more open to talking about wanting to seek uh, help and, and see someone who can help them and counsel them. So much less of a stigma than when I was growing up. It's not anything that I would have ever have mentioned or thought even, not even mentioned. It's not something I would have even thought about. Uh, you know, yeah. we'll talk to someone about, you know, stress, about not running fast and different things like that. I would never have thought about it. I would have just, you know, <laughs> suffered quite silently <laughs> because of the stigma. And that's mm -hmm. definitely have changed for the better. Uh, you yeah. know, I'm seeing it's not only to the point where there's less of a stigma, it's encouraged. And I, I feel like folks are just even casually able to say that, hey, you know, I, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm speaking to somebody and I'm like, you know, that's great. So it's, it's changed for the better. Absolutely. Yeah. Even yeah. if it's not someone that's trained. I mean, Adrian, you can probably <laughs> answer this. One of the things that Coach Fry had down was selling you a dream. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I interviewed Fry, I so that. That, you know, hey. Listen, he was selling some dreams and <laughs> we was buying them. Sometimes knowing we ain't in nobody's shape. <laughs> But Coach Fry talked you up in a way that you felt like you could go out there and do whatever. And you might go out there and blow a gasket. <laughs> but it was almost better, not almost, it was better to go out and do that than to not try at all. But yep. he would literally speak life into you in a way that you would go out there and, and try some mess that after the fact, you'd be like, I don't know why. <laughs> I, I know I was injured for three months. Missed fall training. This man got me going out in 23 seconds, but here we are, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? But it, and, 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 so I say that to say that it, it doesn't even have to be, you know, of course it would be great if you had access to someone, a clinical, cl clinically trained counselor, but sometimes it's just that person that, you know, is able to speak life into you and you can, you know, bounce ideas off of and be encouraged. Yeah. Nah, nah, absolutely. So I want to, I, I always like asking about the transition um, to the pro career. Uh, we kind of jump around a little, which is fine. It's not like there's a, a script or a itinerary or whatever. <laughs> but 
So it's always a tough piece going from the, the, the even though you competed in the Olympics early on, um, that transition from being a college athlete to it being your job and being a professional. And then from there to when you're kind of, you know, I mean, how many more Olympics do you plan on? Oh, this is it. So exactly. So you're at the tail end. So now it's like, hey, let me get another medal. But transitioning into what I'm doing, you know, I talked to Lashina about this. I talked to some other folks like what they're doing, their identity after competing, mm-hmm. because some folks struggle with that. You know, how to what, what do I do from here? I've been this athlete who just competed my whole life. So I like to hear a little bit about the transition, like I said, from the high school, from the uh, college piece to pro and then kind of now where you are right now. And I see you have your foundation shirt on. So I'm assuming, you know, that's, you're putting a lot of energy into that. So yeah, yeah let's go for it. <laughs> yeah. So college to pro man was one of those things that at some point I want to sit down and kind of like, I don't know if it's like write a, a, a manuscript or a how to yeah. guide or something. Go for it. <laughs> That was the area of my career that I 100% like flailed, (laughs) failed, uh, had to figure some ish out. And it's like, you literally go from being a D1 athlete where everything is done for you. Yes. To becoming the CEO of your business and having to do everything for yourself and Preach. understand how to do everything for yourself without a manual. <laughs> so you go from having your massage, your chiropractor, your training, everything set up for you, your classes, your tutoring, hotel rooms, transportation, hotel room, travel breakfast. information, everything is done for you. Breakfast. <laughs> to now you've got to do your day-to-day living your coach is actually your employee now, not <laughs> one signing your scholarship. You've got your agent who gets paid before you get paid. Which <laughs> You've is got a whole nother- taxes, a whole nother, you know what I'm saying? You right. got, you get paid quarterly or biannually. You got to budget your money. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Wait, before you get past that, that gets a lot of people. You know, I don't, man, I, let me let me just this is a segue because that piece that you know I hadn't thought about till you mentioned that. But let's talk about my young black athletes who run fast and get a contract for a hundred thousand dollars and don't know anything about taxes and get paid twice a year and they don't know the percentages like when their agent and coach gets their cut off of what percentage of that and then they don't take their taxes out and they spend all the money. This is this happens all the time. All the all, time. The time okay. and no oh, one's telling me that's been happening since I was competing, though. It's like, crazy. I, I don't know how much more we can say, hey, you know, that this is a thing you have to learn this somehow because that was a big problem when when I was competing. People would get that, you know, shoe contract or whatever, and Ooh, before you money, know, money. They, they, yeah, they owe taxes. They they, they owe taxes. They owe taxes. And then you think it's more money than you have. When you get paid 30000 one time, you think you're rich. You know, you get that yeah. in one check. But you realize you're not getting paid every month. It's fast money. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you highlighted that. That's a problem in track and field. Let me look at the, that's a problem. This needs to change. Okay. Yeah. And then, and it, change and education. And again, talking about the backgrounds that we come from where financial literacy is not something that's emphasized in our communities. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. Just, you know, and then on top of all of that, <laughs> you still got to show up and perform. Yeah, you got to run. <laughs> because, I, because I, I haven't even got to my job yet. <laughs> because if you ran 49 last year and you're running 52 and 53 right now, Nike or whoever is ready to be like, hey, snip snip, that you you better. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it took me a mighty long time <laughs> <laughs> to figure the, the things out. And I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, people around me um, to kind of help with some of it. But where I struggled majorly was performing on the track. And 
I, I struggled with it because I was worried about all of those other things, you know, yeah. because I was adjusting to wait, man, I'm all the way in Europe and my coach isn't here with me. And this was before, like, uh, I've been on the circuit as long as back, back when it was Blackberry. So it wasn't, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. hey, I got an international plan. I can just call you and talk to you. And it was, it wasn't that kind of access back then. So you know, making that transition from pro to, from collegiate to pro was, was tough. It was, it was really <laughs> like literally going from being a college student athlete to being the CEO of my own business without a manual and just kind of figuring it out on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, I, it's, it's something that is lost because it does take, it's sometimes people can make the transition and they perform right away sometimes they need two or three years and it's also as much as you know switching coaches leaving coach fry and going to to lance brahman and bobby kersey and then so what did you do in college how did you train and it was like well to be honest we trained hard but we also raced a lot now you're telling me we had four races for the year like how do we make this up in training you know it was it was all of that stuff too so there were a lot of things to figure out in uh transition that I wish I had a little bit more uh guidance in that area it was just kind of like okay we got you this great contract this is your agent this is your coach this is where you know I'm living here I'm doing this I'm I'm an adult now and then I got to show up and perform it it was tough (laughs) it was tough um now on the flip side you know I'm now mom I'm single mom wasn't planning for that um (laughs) But I was always of the mindset of like always thinking about, you know, there's going to be a life after track. I will never be able to run forever, obviously. Um, But for me, it was in what way can I continue to be an impact and a part of the sport? And, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to let go of the competitive edge of it all. Like, I mean, just watching a track meet, I'm, I'm rocking in my seat and rubbing my knees and like, <laughs> yeah. like I'm on the line, you know? But I know, kudos to you, Adrian, I do not want to coach. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Because I believe coaching is harder than being the athlete. And maybe, I don't know if that's, that's a, a interview that you've done, but I'd be willing to interview you on that. Um, <laughs> but, um, For me, so, you know, largely that's where the Natasha Hastings Foundation came from. Like, what gaps did I feel like I had along the way that I wish that Mm -hmm. I could fill? And and then now the clinical mental health piece, like, okay, I'm working with girls. I was struggling with the mental health piece. Like, I'll be able to pour that back into my athletes. I want to go into sports counseling. I'd, I'd much rather coach your mind than be out at the track with you every day. (laughs) <laughs> so you know just thinking about you know what ways can I be of impact but still feed the competitiveness feed a bit of my soul in there and I've, I've always been thinking about that oh and I skipped over the 400 meter diva thing <laughs> I, was kidding. <laughs> I forgot to mention I somehow named the Gamecocks the Gamecock divas that I think to this day they still <laughs> use it sometimes so 400 meter diva came out of that and then now as a professional I've no I've been known for running in the the lashes and the bold lipstick and all the extra stuff. So I created a cosmetics line. So That's just, cool. you know, keeping bits and pieces of my creativity, but you know, still feeding that competitive fire, I guess. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you've experienced this, Adrian, but um Natasha Hastings and especially when it, when I was working in college access in New York City, was the biggest thing since sliced bread. Uh-huh. Right? There was a time, and it was, it, the, I have two stories. The first one was your senior year in high school when you were going for the 500 meter record. That was, was the first time we race. ran against each other. Yeah. Yeah, I was in that race. Oh, uh, hold on. Yo, you, so you was guys- it Daryl Miles was in that race? Daryl Miles, yep. Daryl Miles was in that race and oh, I forgot on. the other person. <laughs> Natasha Hastings, right? And and okay, so we'll say it's a decent field, not partial. <laughs> she was what fourth out of four people, right? Yep. Something like that. 
Yeah. We finished and we immediately turned around and were like this. Every <laughs> single camera person that was in the building went went right by <laughs> us like you go. this and went immediately there. Every spectator that was in the building converged around this one person. Yeah. And then, um, Ali and let's let's just call a spade a spade because she was nice talking about she was fourth out of four i was last <laughs> you're not, did you break you broke the high school record i i think i did get the high school record in that race casually I think I did. Uh, right so we we just up there for show while she broke the high school record and we're not knocked out of the way my ribs still hurt from that day <laughs> we don't get out of the way we don't want you and then you know i i wasn't working at the armory at that time um, but I took over the college access program a few years later, and I think it was around when you did, was it the body issue? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Adrian, every single desk in there, that yeah. magazine is, I was like, why, do, why does everyone have this? And nobody's telling me every, anything. Everybody's just like, yeah. That's why so we're I, I, I picked on somebody that I knew was going to snitch. I was like, what, what is happening? And they showed it to me. And I think you were going to race in New York City either that weekend or next weekend. Everybody was trying to volunteer any kind of way. Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> uh -huh. to, to get something. And I was like, I don't know if you are aware of it, but your following and your influence on the track community in New York City is insane. Even to this day, like I went back to, to talk with one of my uh, mentees and I was like, I, I had no idea what, what 400 meter deep it was, but I was like, that sounds like that could be me. I mean, they're <laughs> like, nothing to do with you and they were the ones that told me what it was so there there's definitely a huge 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 sphere of influence there that that's kind of been in my peripheral ever since you've been in high school like Natasha Hastings is a recurring theme and that's <laughs> gotta make you feel good in some yeah. way yeah yeah I mean it's humbling in the sense of like it because it makes me think of like you know, telling the stories that no one knows. And, and that's like being the girl from Queens that I would wake up at six in the morning to catch the 6.53 a.m. Long Island Railroad train to Penn Station to catch the A up to AP Randolph, go to school all day, take the train for an hour to Brooklyn to go to practice, then take a, the train back home for another hour. It's like all that stuff. <laughs> from back then and doing all of that and still dealing with, you know, body image, not fitting in, all of those things that the 400 meter diva, the 400 meter diva went to prom by herself. Nobody asked me to go to prom with them. I went to prom by myself, you know? But to think about the little girl who, really? I got to do some amazing things, but I was still like a little girl on the inside dealing with some things, struggling with some things. It's that part of the story that I want to be able to tell because I feel like that's what A, makes me relatable, but also B, I've come through some, I don't know if we curse on here, but I've come through some shit. <laughs> um, but I, I really want to be an example that I'm, I'm just the girl who rode the A train to, to AP Randolph and I had a dream and I kept working on it and I failed a lot along the way a lot but, but. I think that, that's the kind of thing that's going to resonate with people because like you said you you see the 400 diva and you know I, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because I, I have some inside information but a lot of people see you on a pedestal and they can only make assumptions about how you how you got there you know, for someone to find out that you went to prom alone is probably going to be mind blowing for them um, to find out that you've had body issues, right? You're, you're in the body issue of a magazine. You're what? But some of that was conquering right. what I was. Right, right. With. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's what I think makes it so amazingly relatable. Like you said, like no one's going to think that the person people aspire to be don't like or don't appreciate, you know, who they are. 
But I think that I, I, I truly believe that that's something that we need to see more of in our community and more of in athletics. I think, um, I, I just, I just want to be real. Like I love sitting across from, you know, Michelle and we talk about something, Michelle Carter that is, and we can talk about something and I'll be like, man, it didn't look exactly like that, but I went through something similar to that. And this notion that like, I'm going through something by myself and it's like, but no, actually, I mean, Amberly. Amberly's on my board for the foundation and we worked oh, really? out. That's cool. Yeah. She created, so Amberly's now a practicing OBGYN. Wait, wait, she, say her, Amber, Amberly Nesbitt. Nesbitt Winley, Dr. Winley. NCAA <laughs> champion in the 100 meters. NCAA meter. champion, yes, in the 100. 2006, right? 2006, it was our sophomore year. Mm -hmm. um, so she's now a doctor. We were roommates in college and um, she created the, base, basically created the curriculum that we offered through um, my foundation. And it's about puberty, self-love, relationships, um, setting boundaries, self-respect and respect for others. Um, but we talk about things that we were going through in college as roommates that we didn't even knock on the door and say, hey girl, I'm going through X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And it, it's that piece of community that I want to bring, you know, and, and for girls and for sport, you know, that we don't have to go through this by ourselves because most times it's not just you, you know? So, I, I mean, I'm not, I, everything back to being the girl at Carolina, being the little nine-year-old who started track that it just so happened to be the 1996 Summer Olympic Games that year, watching that Olympics and dreaming at, I turned 10 by that point, but dreaming to be an Olympian. But the journey was, you know, it seems glamorous, but like I said, I failed a lot to get there, but I continue to go. I just gave birth 14 months ago. The games were postponed and here I am crazy enough to still believe that, you know, I can do it one last time, but <laughs> there's some bumps along the way and I'm going to keep it real with you. <laughs> some days I don't even know if I'm going to get back up, but, you know, I, I figure out a way to get back up and, and, and that's, if there's anything that I give back to the sport when I'm done with the sport and walk away from it, it's, it's that, it's that, you know, it's, it's going to be gritty. Is gonna be ugly. I trained myself to make it look pretty, but <laughs> it is not always, you know, pretty. But the end result is so worth it. And I think also being okay with not being okay. Hmm. It, it, a lot of and th just you know thinking about you mentioned your failures and your flailings. Um, you 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 have a lot of attention and people want to be you they want to be like you there there's there's a lot uh, you have a huge fan base if i may say that and some of your failings have been quite public um how how do you deal with that scrutiny like how do you how do you manage to not internalize that and and kind of pull away how do you make a young woman that's, for example, involved with your foundation feel like this isn't about a reflection of her, that good, bad things happen to good people. Yeah, I always, I think a true champion is not, not how many times you win, but how you bounce back from your losses. Hmm. And, you know, 2013 will always be a special year to me because it was a year of coming back from what I, at that point, I literally was like done. Like I'm done, I'm going back to school. This track thing is not for me. Um, and yes, like facing that whole, like she's a failure. And even so much as my breakout race in 2013 was, was back in New York at Icon Stadium. And I remember 
there was even like a, a conversation like, should she even go? Because, you know, her running at home, it just seems like going back home is not good for her. You know, like it's, it's just too much pressure. And it sucks. And I'm not going to sit up here and act like <laughs> it's easy and, you know, hold my head high. And that's one of the things that I am good at is, you know, I can again, make some things look pretty. That's really a mess on the inside. Um, but there's a sense of learning how to turn those things off. And it's, it's a constant practice. It's not something that you just up and do one day, but also making the choice not to give up on yourself. And there's nothing worse. I, I think it's Michael Jordan who might've said it, that the only thing worse then failure is not trying at all. And so for me to have a baby and decide, okay, well, this is it. I, I, I would never be able to live with myself because I knew what I was doing in the process. We all know what, what it takes to get pregnant. So, you know, no, he wasn't planned, but he happened. <laughs> and I'm happy that he happened. I'm in love. I'm obsessed with him, but I've got to do this for me. I've got to prove this to myself. And, you know, I'm, I'm at a place now where it's not even what happens or how it happens, because if I don't win another medal, you still can't take away what I've done up to this point. Exactly. Exactly. So now it's to the point where this is just for me. This is, I will never walk away from a situation or a thing feeling like I didn't give it my all. And I'm also at a place where I define my successes and I'm not waiting for anybody else to give me my flowers. <laughs> I'm going to give myself my own flowers. Write this down. <laughs> that, that largely comes from another thing that I, it wasn't until 2016 that I, I made that decision for myself was you know, you read off my resume and it sounds great. I didn't appreciate my resume because for my entire career, I've been told, oh, well, most of all your medals are relay medals. You need to go win an individual medal. And then I got to the 2016 games. And when I tell this story, I always have to preface this <laughs> with two things can exist in one. This is no disrespect to anyone. I'm just calling a spade a spade. Um, Allison Felix is the GOAT. She's going to be the greatest of all time. She is Hall of, future Hall of Fame, all of those things. But I'll never forget the story at the games in 2016 was, you know, she's the most decorated female athlete. She has, uh, I want to say she was going after six gold medals. And I sat back and I was like, but four of them are relay medals. So why is it for her, we're celebrating those, but for me, my career has been worthless because I only have relay medals. And it was that day that I decided, I'm gonna give my, myself my flowers. I don't have to wait for y'all to celebrate what I've done. Cause the truth of the matter is you can't take that back. I did all of those things. I contributed to all of those things. So even understanding that I'm not going to let anyone else define what my success is and what makes me happy and et cetera, et cetera. It's hard. <laughs> 2016, I was 30. So it took 30 years to figure that out, but I can't wait for y'all to give me my applause. Like I know that I've worked my ass off to this point and I have the medals to show for it. And just because I didn't do it the way that you prescribed that I do it or you feel is worthy of whatever you're still not going to take away what I've accomplished to this point so I went all over the place with that <laughs> but you just you just kind of got to get to the point where it's it's truly your journey that you're defining for yourself and you don't let anybody else de deter you diminish it any of that like this is for you to define and celebrate for yourself 
And the other thing is too, no one that has ever been to the Olympic games or been in an Olympic final is, is going to talk to you like that. No one's going to say, well, it's just re relay medals. Yeah. I was going to say is it's, it's like, who would say it's the folks who right. have never gotten off their butt. Come on. Oh, it's only <laughs> a relay Olympic medal. Really? Yeah. Really? Like, come on. Yeah. Nobody yeah. went. So I, I would, but one thing I like you, you, you constantly are touching on failure. And I like that because you know, and I'm sure Aliana has experienced this, you know, as a coach, there is an inclination um, to folks, especially if let's say they're coming out of high school and, and they've been good in high school. A lot of times they'll get in a scenario where they won't try their best at things for the fear that they're going to actually fail. And then they define themselves by that failure. So you'll notice like there's be talented folks who just they're halfway doing it or they'll always make an excuse like I don't feel like good today so that if they go out there and they don't do well, they have something to fall back on because if they have to come face to face with the fact that they tried their best and still lost, that's devastating instead of embracing that and saying this will make me better. Everyone who's good has failed. I mean, I, I have to remind people that Bo used to get his butt kicked. They forget. <laughs> They forget. I'm like, hello. Yeah, I'm like, hello. He was he's gonna get like some relics. <laughs> relics. Tyson, Tyson experiment, those guys in the 200 was 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 giving him the business. And people yeah. forget that. And and so he had to fail and realize, whoa, you know, and I'm sure he trained hard, but I've heard that back then he wasn't really on it, you know. And then all of a sudden he became the best sprinter, the fastest person in history. <laughs> If he didn't face that failure, if he always was able to just skate by, he wouldn't have been able to achieve that. So I'm glad you mentioned how much you had to fail. It's it's mandatory. And a lot of parents, any parents watching this, a lot of parents these days try to prevent their kids from failing. They're doing everything they can to stop them from being able to fail. I want this to be perfect. I don't want it to be hard. Not knowing that you're, you're putting your kid at a disadvantage because life will test them at some point life is going to test them and if they're not used to confronting that and dealing with that failure face to face is going to break them so failure is part of being successful anyone who's successful has failed as you have just explained you said you failed a lot of times everyone I probably, I, no 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 i get ready to say i probably i have failed more than i have won <laughs> i feel like that's the case though there's there's a lot of listen a lot of successful people, it's failure, failure, failure. I mean, and you got to think that is the concept behind training. When you lift weights until your muscles can't do anything, they rebuild and come back, what? Stronger. It's muscle okay. failure to come back stronger. So you're failing at whatever you're doing. And if it doesn't break you, if you don't quit and you decide to keep on trying at some point, you're going to conquer this thing. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear you mention failure so many times. Failure. That's where the real work begins. So folks. Yeah. Don't be afraid to fail. Yeah, Go out more. there and fail. Go fail at something today. <laughs> I have one one more question. Oh, I thought you were wrapping up, but I, I have my, uh, another question for you, Natasha. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you you you've had a couple coaches, um, and one in particular I have a question about because as a quarter miler. Um, no one is thinking I got to go to Otto Bolden to help me. <laughs> <laughs> Love Otto to death. You're, and my, you're friends with Otto. The beginning of time <laughs> as a quarter miler, never did I think going to Otto. <laughs> hey, yo, very, yo. very fair question and something that I was asked a lot. So, <laughs> um, a couple of things, talking about being the CEO of my business. Um, I have been with my current coach now going on nine years. So at that point, it was about four or five years. And I was seeing success with him, but I was plateauing, basically. And going into the uh, 2016 year, I was like, man, like, I'm doing great, but I've got to do something different. And, and actually in 2015 in Beijing, I, I didn't make the finals in the 400. And so going back a little bit over my resume, 22.5 in the 200, 11, 24 in the 100. That 22.5 actually came in 2016 in a straight line working with Otto. 
And one of the things that um, has always remained true with me is the faster I am, the faster my 400. And uh, my coach here, D2, is awesome. He gets me into great shape. Um, I don't know how I run the times that I run from April all the way into damn near October. Like he just knows how to extend my season that way. But there was, I just wasn't tapping into the speed that I wanted to tap into. And so mm-hmm. the work that I was doing with Otto was like speed work and form. We were mainly working on technique. And if anyone, if you actually like watched my races from 2016 and prior to, you would see that there were like changes in my form and, mm-hmm. and how yeah. I was running. And those were the things that made the difference in my running that year. It was, so it was speed work. And it was more of a consulting <laughs> kind of thing because I think it, it, it kind of got um, confused or misrepresented in kind of like a way that like Ato was coaching me. I was going down to him once a month, stay for two or three days, we'd work on some things and then we might work on some things uh, remotely. But D2 is and was my coach that year. We just kind of did some supplement work with Ato. But <laughs> I want to point out, but before going back to the, being the CEO of my business, that was a hard decision for me because I, me and D2, like we ride, <laughs> like y'all know what it's like when you're working with your coach and y'all are in the trenches and y'all are going to battle together. So, you know, being able to say, hey coach, I like what we're doing and out of respect for you, you know, I want to continue what we're doing, but for what I need, this is a call that I have to make. Mm-hmm. I had to put on some big girl panties to have that conversation with him to let him know that like, this is what I need to do for me. And I need for you to respect this. I'm going to make mm-hmm. sure that everybody plays their role and no one gets out of line. And we, you know, aren't uh, counterproductive and working against one another. Right. But this is what I got to do for me. And at that, that's where being the professional athlete comes in sometimes where you got to be the one to make some tough calls in situations where you're used to your coach being the one making all of the calls. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely a, a, a shift <laughs> um, in, in the relationship there having to do that. Um, do you, so do you feel like it helped you or it worked out the way you thought it would work out and accomplish what you thought it would accomplish? I think so, yeah, I did. We did have a a good working relationship that year. Um, We continued to work a little bit through 17. um, And then we, I mean, we remain in communication but it was kind of one of those things where I kind of look at it like, you know, you graduate from high school, you got the foundation that you needed from high school. So you move on to college get the foundation you need from. So it was, it was one of those situations where I got what I needed from him. I still use, he gave me the tools. I still use the tools every now and again, I might check in, but I got what I needed from that foundation. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now I've heard of other athletes doing the same thing, having a, especially veterans, having a primary coach and then going off I forgot who used to do that, but I think they used to do like their block start and speed work with like John Drummond. And then they yeah. used to do Tyson. Their, uh, Tyson. Yeah, yeah, he trained with Lance most of the time, right? Mm-hmm. And then he's, yeah, so it's not it's not unusual, especially if you're a veteran, you know, I was talking to LaShawn and you get to a point where it's like, you you kind of know what you need, yeah. you know, you're doing it long enough. So no, that's, that's pretty Everybody's cool. Everybody's gotta put their egos aside. Cause even if you think about like a it's collegiate, fun. you know, Coach Fry might have sent us over to, um, what was the sprint coach when we were there? Um, I'm looking at him and Coach McCauley. Yeah, exactly. Some sort of, or he might have sent us over to Stan for some strength work. Like working together. Yeah, you just need a little tweaking here and there. And, you know, it's it's a team effort in an individual sport. (laughs) So cool thing I've seen, um, you know, I I mentioned this when I was talking to Lashinda, how the, the impact that my mom had for me running track, you know, I never missed a track practice growing up. She would wait in the car until I was done. And, and they sent me off to Jersey, which allowed me to have more opportunity to, to walk on in South Carolina. And so everything was, it started with my mom and Lashinda talked about how her mom made her run hills. And, you know, when she was ready to give up, 
even at an advanced point in her career when she was just not, you know, doing well, her mom was there to kind of like, hey, you know, get up there. And from my understanding, your mom plays a, you know, a big role in, in, in what you do as well. And I saw a video on your YouTube channel, which, you, you know, you post a lot of stuff. And, you, you know, you had, you know, you was out of the track me and you, your mom was giving you feedback and she sounds tough, man. Like she sounds, she keeps it real. Like, Hey, you know, you look good. You know, <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. <laughs> that booty's looking a little big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to hear about, mom. about you mom has, how your mom has influenced you and, 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 you know, helped you, how she's backed you. Cause it seems like moms are the common, uh, there's a common thread here. Moms, you know, they go hard with the track stuff. Yeah, man. I mean, my mom, <sighs> she, my, first of all, my mom's my best friend. Um, like no, no lie. Like I have my son, she's here with me, helping me raise my son right now. You know, like, however she can be supportive of whatever it is that I'm working on, she's, she's there and she's backing me a hundred percent. But the other thing that's cool about my mom is as much as she pushes me, she still to this day, is this what you want to do? Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. sure you want to do this? And and are you doing this for you? Don't feel like you have to do it for anybody else but you. Right. And I can honestly say from the time that anyone realized that I had a little bit of talent, that's always been her attitude, always been. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's so unique because I, I, I love our story. My mom made the 84 Olympic team for Trinidad she got injured, so she didn't get to go. My mom's middle name is Natasha. So I feel like she then had me in 86. So I feel like I'm finishing the story that she didn't get to finish. But even in all of that, she's still just supportive. It's, it's not like, you know, I want you to go out there and do this for me. Like, and, and, and even to this day, out of however many hundreds of thousand people in the in the crowd, I can still look up and find her somehow, some way. And just seeing the joy on her face, seeing me out there doing what I love. Um, she's just my best friend, man. I, I, I'm i grateful that I got the mother that I got because <laughs> I know that there are some parents out there that it's, you know, sometimes when I'm working with the kids now, it's kind of like, yeah, you can push your kid all you want to, but at the end of the day, if they don't want it, <laughs> all of this is really, you're wasting your time, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and and a lot of that, you end up taking the joy out of it for the kids. And I, I say this all the time. I had friends that were more raw talented than me. And whether it be their coaches or just their parents that just didn't make it fun, that took the fun out of it. My mom was also the mom that came to practice. I'll never forget, I was 10 years old. I'm not embarrassed to say this anymore. I peed myself. I had 10 400s. Oh, 10 400s at 10. That's crazy. My mom walked into practice <laughs> my work and she was like, wait, what are you doing? Come on, let's go. She took me off the track team that day. And she was like, you're not going to burn my child out. 10 so 400s? 10 400s at 10 years old. Yeah, at 10 years what old. What are you trying to accomplish with that? <laughs> right. <laughs> What event I, are you training for? Uh, 10, and at that point, I was I was still running the one and the two. So what was the purpose of 10 400s? Nah, that's not doing anything good. I don't remember doing that in my life ever. I don't no. do that now. Do 10 400s. <laughs> good Lord. So, yeah, my mom has been my encourager, my protector, just just all around support, man. She, she's awesome. That's cool. So what's the future? What's in store for you going forward? Um, you know, of course, we're training for the games next year, right? Yeah. And what would yeah. I have going on? Yeah, so I'm taking classes. I'm mm -hmm. running behind my son. <laughs> I know. So, you, so you, I've seen you on some of your videos, like he's there at the track meet with you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it was kind of limited this year, but he's, yeah, he came to all of the track meets. Um, like I'm you're doing a lot of juggling, you know, yeah. <laughs> You figure it, figure it out real quick. I don't know how, but you just fall into line, fall into the role really quickly. But um, that that's been pretty cool. I mean, I know mm -hmm. he won't remember these things, but I, you know. Well, how, anyway, how, how old is he? Fourteen months. 
yeah, I don't know how how far back does memory. I don't know the memory thing. Like what point? We'll what point? YouTube videos. Oh yeah. yeah. I I I remember my earliest memory is three. Oh. So I know for sure he won't. But you know we got videos and pictures uh-huh. and social media. And yeah, stuff. you post all the time. You have a all lot, you know. Yeah. Your social so, media, you're all over the place. I'm a little excessive, but. <laughs> well, I follow you, so I see all your all your stuff. It's pretty I cool. Appreciate Keep it, it up. Keep it up. Nobody's here to see me anymore. It's, it's the Liam show. <laughs> nah, you're inspiring tons of, of athletes everywhere, you know. Keep Thank it up. I, I have another question about um, as it pertains to your uh, cosmetic empire. What can I do Uh-oh. for my eyelashes and eyebrows? Oh yeah. girl, I can I can hook you up. We got we got doing well, anything. We the just... golden girl lashes that are very natural. So <laughs> if you're not like you know, if you're a beginner lash wearer, Golden mm-hmm. Girl is where to start. We also have a eyeliner slash glue pen. So it's all in one. So it may, it cuts time. It's easy, beginner friendly. I got you. I'm going to need like a beard oil or something. <laughs> some kind of like. That, that's in the making. That's in the making. <laughs> Give me some time on that one. Coach <laughs> Diva. <laughs> Oh, that's a line. Diva coach line. Coach Diva. <laughs> there you go. I know. You have a whole bunch of coaches. You start with me and Adrian. You know, we, all, all we need is free products. So we'll rock it. What would you put on your beard? I'd be like, man, it's that Natasha Hastings right here. You know? <laughs> we'll, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. You know? <laughs> okay, I don't know okay. I've never seen Adrian as a tra- at a track meet, but he is dressed to the nine. Hey, man. I, 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 I've seen fine. pictures, but yeah. listen. We went to college together, so I I'm not yeah, surprised. You are <laughs> not surprised. First of all, I'm not well, used to his hair yet, but <laughs> I know. No, no. Listen, we're at the trap meets for ten hours, so we may as well, you know, you may as well have some some fun with what you're wearing. We know they're all day affairs. If I'm not the one, like I I tell people all the time, like I'm going to work. Don't you get dressed yeah. up to go to your job? So, I mean. Hey, I've seen Mickey and Lisa. Was it Mickey at the start line putting on, you know, getting, getting right? I'm like, oh, y'all, y'all fly, so. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're on TV. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to work. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't call them divas for nothing, sir. <laughs> hey, I like it. You know, you got to be fly. Hey, look, track, you got to have some confidence, man. Have fun with it. I'm all about it. Yeah. Go out there and do your feel thing. Good, you know? Feel good, feel good, run good. But we'll definitely be following you this coming year. You know, wish you all the best. I want to see you with another medal. You know, that's gonna be pretty cool. And um, you know, I'm glad you're able to take some time out of your busy schedule to come chat with us, you know. Anything for my Gamecock family. Oh yeah. I, I, know, I know you don't you don't want to uh give too much Gamecock love, but no, I know I'm I doing too much. I really enjoyed this. No. <laughs> Never. Yeah, well, I'm recruiting against them, so I'm starting to, you know. Send this to all your kids. I know. <laughs> well, they're going to see it all anyway. No, mm-hmm. but I know a lot of the kids on the team are going to love hearing your story. And especially, they're going to be able to relate to it. And like I said, some of that stuff, man, you know, hearing stuff from me all day, I'm coach. But hearing you say it, it's like, oh, I failed a lot. They're like, no way. You failed? Like, yeah, it's part of it. That's how you get good. So, you know, I love hearing, you know, all you superstars tell your stories. I appreciate it. Oh, like, come on, man. Uh, youth champion uh, record here, casually. Right, right. Oh, stats, the stat sheet. Don't have me reminisce about my bruised ribs still. <laughs> I know, but get out of the way, the camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, um, no. But, you know, it, it, it's great to see you accomplish and evolve the way that you have from like I said, from that high school senior to the CEO of your own company, to having a foundation, to yeah, doing yeah. all these um, amazing things that you're doing. It, it's just been a fun, fun journey to watch. I've enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I need more of this interaction. Yes, so, we can do it again. Sometimes that's what we are. Yeah, but I mean, I'm transitioning, but like you guys are now in your professional careers and to just like, I love seeing us like progress through life and figure out, cause you're talking about me figuring out the changes. Y'all had to figure them out too. 
Oh, so, man. <laughs> so surprised yeah. if I'm tapping in like, hey, <laughs> you know, like I, I have a career coach. Like, um, excuse me, how do I write a resume? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I've been running my whole life, but now, you know, those skills yeah. that I didn't have to use, I now have to tap into. And, and I'm not going to be afraid to say, I need help over here. <laughs> hey, man, you can call me anytime. I will. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, appreciate it, Tasha. Thanks for coming on. We won't hold you any longer. It's already been quite some time, I think, already. Whew. Yeah. Time flies in these conversations, you know? They're oh, wow. Well, I'm glad <laughs> we got to do this because I definitely flubbed on the time, so my bad on that, no. but this this was actually fun. But this is why I always tell people, people always ask, like, how long? I'm like, about an hour, because I know it, how it just flows. I don't want to be like, you're going to be on here for an hour and a half, because then folks would be like, oh, my God, that's too long. So I was like, yeah, you're 45 minutes or so. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> My bad. Well, I couldn't tell that it went long. So. Right. No, this no, is no, no. I'm glad <laughs> <laughs> having a good time. We'll do it again it's sometime. After like this. Yeah. Have you we'll thought about you. getting into acting? Who, me? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> so no. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, think about it. You know, loves you. You have an active channel on YouTube, very active, right? And on social media, Instagram. Why not? Not acting, but I do need to get more serious about content creation. Um, and I just, that is one of the things that within motherhood and everything else on my plate right now that I feel like is lacking. But I do want to get more into motivational, commentating, that kind of thing. But I don't know if acting is my thing. What about more commentating like um, auto, like track, more tracks? Yeah, track. I would love to do something like that. But I also need to do the work to do that. <laughs> I haven't been doing anything to set myself up for that. So, um, which honestly, that was kind of where the, the YouTube thing came from, where I was like, let me start playing around with sitting in front of the camera, talk about things related to the sport. And then it, you know, it ends up your audience kind of guides where it goes. Cause you got to give your audience what they want. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'll pick it back up. That'll be cool. Like said, the camera loves you. So that's, thank that's you. Start. <laughs> thank you. I just need to focus. 